You can hear me all right. Everyone? Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. And let's get started then on lecture two. So just as a reminder of what I'm trying to achieve over the course of these four lectures, the first two lectures are this introduction to topological phases of matter. And then in the third lecture, I'm going to be talking about the topological physics with cold atoms. And in the fourth lecture, the topological physics with photonics. Uh, so thank you very much for all of your questions yesterday. So do keep asking uh, if anything's not clear. And I think we'll also, again, have the question session at the end. Yeah. So please feel free to keep thinking of questions as we go. Uh, so where did we leave off yesterday? Well, we had talked about uh, the idea of a geometrical berry phase, because my aim was to explain to you a little bit about the quantum Hall effect, which is perhaps the most famous and, in my view, probably the most important example of a topological phase of matter. And so I talked about how we can think of a geometrical phase that arises in quantum mechanics when we take a system and we let it undergo an adiabatic evolution. And so the adiabatic point was very important because it meant that if our system was prepared in a particular eigenstate, it remained in that eigenstate uh, after a closed contour of evolution in this parameter space up to phase factors, which could include that Berry phase. And I showed you how, just from Schrodinger's equation, we could derive the form of the Berry phase uh, as this derivative uh, of the eigenstates of our space. And I also said, well, let's use some analogies, for instance, with geometry and introduce a few other concepts. And in particular, this idea of a connection, which is just taking this thing and calling it uh, the Berry connection, and the Berry curvature. And so by Stokes' theorem, we can go from the line integral to a surface integral with respect to this Berry curvature. And that's very useful because Berry curvature is this gauge invariant and therefore physical quantity, which can have many interesting consequences. And I also talked about how, uh, as we'll use a bit later, all of this is really analogous to things that we've seen before, in particular, the idea of magnetic flux, magnetic vector potential, and magnetic fields. So there's a great analogy with all of these things. But now I want to move to topology, because that's the subject of uh, these lectures. And I also want to now specify a little bit more what I'm talking about in terms of electrons moving in periodic potentials, and so therefore block states of energy bands. So at the moment, this whole derivation was just for generic set of parameters. Um, but let's focus now on, oh, maybe I need to be a bit closer, on the case of uh, energy band of eigenstates. Uh, so as I said in the previous lecture, we're going to be talking about topological band theory. So these are the tools that we're needing. And in particular, we have these block states that are the states that are making up these energy bands. And now, if I just plug these block states into my definition of the Berry curvature, then I can define the Berry curvature of a particular band, which I can write like this. And the important thing here is that this band has to be gapped for this to be the right formula. And that's kind of inherent in the fact that I made that assumption of adiabaticity when we were deriving the Berry phase. Now, we can generalize this to include degeneracies. Uh, and then the Berry uh, curvature is no longer this vector field, but actually becomes uh, a matrix and can be a bit more complicated. So I'm not going to do that in these lectures. So this is. Uh, for instance, the Berry curvature of, say, this lowest band. And so you can see that this is geometrical in the sense that it's telling us about how those eigenstates are changing as a function of the block momenta in the Brillouin zone. And crucially for what follows and for this uh, topological invariant that I'm going to talk about, we have to remember that the Brillouin zone is actually got periodic boundary conditions. And that's because this quasi-momentum is only defined up to this uh, 2 pi times the reciprocal lattice vector. 
And so what I want you to think about is taking this 2D Brillouin zone and gluing together the opposite edges of the Brillouin zone. So if you take, uh, you can draw it obviously flat, but if you glue together this side of the zone and this side of the zone and the top and bottom of the zone, then what you would get would be a closed parameter space that is like a torus. And the fact that this is a closed parameter space is crucial when we want to talk about topology. Because uh, I showed you last time this analogy with the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, which was saying if we had the Gaussian curvature of a surface, that we could integrate the Gaussian curvature over a whole closed surface, which means over the whole surface, like the whole surface of a sphere, and we would get out the genus of that particular surface. And now what we want to do is we want to integrate the Berry curvature over the whole Brillouin zone to find out about the global topology of this energy band. Uh, so this is a little bit of a hand-wavy explanation of why we should get out an integer if we integrate the Berry curvature over the whole Brillouin zone. So let's just imagine taking a contour within this Brillouin zone. And uh, around a contour, uh, we can think about gaining this Berry phase. And I told you that we could calculate a Berry phase by integrating the Berry curvature over that surface. So let's integrate the Berry curvature over this surface. But because this is a closed manifold, because we have these periodic boundary conditions, I could equally have chosen to calculate the Berry phase by calculating uh, using an integral over the opposite part of the surface, okay? And this works because this has the periodic boundary conditions. So you can imagine, for instance, if you had a sphere, that you can either integrate over the top of the sphere or the bottom of the sphere. But because the contour is the same, I should get the same Berry phase uh, up to 2 pi times an integer because it should be the same physical effect. It's the same contour. And I've just made this choice as to which bit of the surface I've integrated over. Um, and now just imagine for yourself that we take a trick where let's just reduce the size of that inner, that contour towards zero. And then hopefully you can convince yourself, as I say in this hand wavy way, that you could get to the limit where one of the phases is being integrated, calculated using a vanishing area whereas the other integral is now the whole Brillouin zone, and that integral over the whole Brillouin zone is now quantized as an integer. And that is what we call the Chern number. Okay, so I've actually given a slightly different argument, which is a bit more precise in the online notes, but I didn't want to go through that uh, now because I think this is a little bit easier to see, but do come and ask me later if you want to know about that. And that is just a simple argument as to why integrating Berry curvature over this closed surface gives us an integer. And the fact that it's an integer is key because an integer cannot be changed uh, by small de deformations. The only way you can change the integer is by doing something so drastic to the system, in this case, closing the band gap uh, and then reopening the band gap to change the churn number. And that's what we mean by the robustness of this topological invariant. And you can also see this is a global property now because we had to integrate the local Berry curvature over the whole Brillouin zone. Now, I also want to uh, emphasize, because I think this was something that a few people asked me questions about after the lecture yesterday, that these pictures I'm drawing are, of course, not so easy to visualize because I am drawing this, but what I actually mean when you do uh, the integral over the shaded area is integrating this Berry curvature, which of course is a very complicated object. So I'm not talking about seeing the fact that the Brillouin zone is a torus. I'm talking about the topology of the eigenstates that are defined in the Brillouin zone, okay? So that's a key point to have in mind. We're talking about topological properties associated with the eigenstates of a band. And now, why should we care? Why does this have any physical quantity, uh, physical meaning? Well, as I talked about yesterday, 
The churn number is the topological invariant that underlies the quantization of conductance in the quantum Hall effect. And this is a very simple argument uh, that requires you to accept a couple of things, but that gives you that idea of the topological nature of the quantum Hall effect quite directly. And in particular, the thing I want you to accept is that if we were to consider a wave packet moving in a geometrical energy band, that the effect of the Berry curvature would be to give this wave packet, so this is the center of mass position, the center of mass momentum, and the effect of the Berry curvature is to give the center of mass, uh, uh, sorry, center of mass velocity this additional contribution, this uh, rate of change of the center of mass momentum crossed with the Berry curvature at the center of mass of the wave packet. And the reason I want you to accept this is because I've said the Berry curvature is analogous to a magnetic field. But now I have a Berry curvature in the momentum space, so it's analogous to a magnetic field in momentum space. And this is just like a Lorentz force, but with the positions of momentum, uh, the roles of position and momentum switched. Okay, this is obviously not a derivation, for the derivation, you can go back to all of these uh, beautiful papers, and indeed the idea comes through already uh, in the early 1950s as band theory was being developed. So this is a property of a wave packet moving in a periodic potential where the eigenstates have got geometrical properties, that we have this additional term. So if instead we had the Lorentz force, the Lorentz force would of course be entering as an additional force alongside this electric field. So we've just switched but now we can ask what happens if instead of a wave packet, we have a band insulator. So what does that mean? Well, in this hand wavy way, we can think of summing up the contribution of all of the different momenta in the Brillouin zone over all of the bands that we have fully occupied and seeing what current we get flowing as a result. Uh, so, in uh, equations, what we can do is we can take this center of mass velocity, and this is defined with respect to this center of mass momentum. We can substitute the bottom expression into the top expression, and we can integrate this over all the different momenta within uh, a band. And we can sum it over the number of bands that we have. And uh, we check. We multiply it as well by minus e because we're calculating the current that is flowing as a result, the current density that's flowing as a result of that, and we see what we get. And the first term is a group velocity term, which is just uh, something that most of you will have found in solid state physics, and that depends on the gradient of the band. But the thing is, because we have a periodic band, everything that goes up must come down. So if you integrate this over the whole band, the going up and the coming down cancels out, and this term doesn't contribute to a filled band transport. This term, on the other hand, after uh, putting in, for instance, a particular orientation of this electric field, you can show that you get, uh, for a field of EY, an electric field EY, you will get a current along X which depends now on this integral over the Berry curvature over the whole Brillouin zone. And that's the churn number. So this is a very uh, hand wavy derivation based on semi-classics. And actually, of course, the much better derivation based on the Kubo formula was one of the things that Thaulus won the Nobel Prize last year for. So I do recommend for you to go and read that paper if you're interested, because it's very readable. So that's just trying to... Uh, give you a little bit of a motivation for why the churn number should have this remarkable transport properties. And this is just saying in words, so we now uh, say that the churn number is therefore responsible for a quantized conductance, so that's just performing this integral, replacing this one with the 1 over 2 pi as the churn number, and uh, the conductance, of course, Jx over Ey in this uh, orientation. And I also mentioned that we had a bulk boundary correspondence coming through, which I'm not proving, but uh, which is saying that for every uh, topological invariant associated with the band, we can ask what is happening on the boundary of the system. 
And in particular, I gave you an argument yesterday as to why at the boundary of the system we should have gapless modes because the topology has to change. And in the case of the quantum Hall effect, those are chiral gapless modes. So this is the number of uh, current carrying edge states that we have around the system. And I also said to you that this is a uh, state of matter that comes in the first row of that topological classification, which is the classification for time reversal symmetry breaking. So what do we mean by time reversal symmetry breaking? Well, the easiest example to think about is, OK, we've applied a magnetic field. And that magnetic field, as an external magnetic field, is breaking the time reversal symmetry. Um, this sounds great. Uh, we can think of the Lorentz force. Actually, I wouldn't be standing here and talking to you if it were really as straightforward as that in, for instance, cold atoms and photonics, where we no longer have charged particles to play with. So we can't just apply a magnetic field and look for a quantum Hall effect. So we actually have to come up with many, many sophisticated ways of breaking time reversal symmetry in order to see this. And that's going to be a lot of what I talk about in the next couple of lectures. So other ways that we can mimic this physics. And uh, just to highlight some of the models that are really important. So of course, if you just think about a continuum charged particle in a magnetic field, that will give you the quantum Hall effect. And that's just the physics of Landau levels. Uh, but actually, it turns out one of the more interesting models for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the harper hofstadt model, which is an example of what happens when we try to take that quantum Hall system, the particle in a magnetic field, and put it on a lattice. And so what I want to do next is actually just very briefly introduce to you what the harper hofstadt model looks like because it's one of the main models that we care about simulating in cold atoms and photonics. And it's got a lot of richness in its structure. Um, so to talk about the harper hofstadt model, I should first talk about how do we include the effects of a magnetic field when we're talking about particles on a tight binding lattice. Uh, so you may or may not have uh, seen this before, but uh, what we do is we use uh, the piles substitution, which is basically to say, normally we have a type binding hopping process that takes us from this lattice site to this lattice site. So we have the annihilation of the particle on this site and the creation of the particle on this site with a hopping amplitude Jx. But now in the presence of a magnetic field, what should happen to this hopping amplitude is that it becomes complex. And in particular, it gains a complex phase called the piles phase, which depends on the line integral of the magnetic vector potential that the particle has experienced as it did this uh, hop from one site to the next site. And one of the ways the uh, So I've got two indices because I'm now going to do two dimensions. So this at the moment is so just is X? Right. Yeah. Because I want to justify this as being like the aronoff bohm phase that you get when you hop around a plaquette. So let's take uh, this case of a particle hopping in 2D on a plaquette. So this is just a foresight system. And if we were to have a magnetic field, then we know in quantum mechanics, a particle hopping around this closed loop, so if it goes from here to here to here to here and back, it should gain the phase associated with the magnetic flux that it's hopping around contained. And that's exactly what the piles phase is designed to do. Uh, so for instance, uh, we have to choose a particular gauge for the magnetic vector potential because it's a gauge-dependent quantity, as I said yesterday. And a typical gauge to choose is the Landau gauge because it means that we have a magnetic vector potential with only one non-zero component. And so if you look at these, these are the phases that you gain as you hop. So for instance, as you go from here to here, you'll get in my notation from here, this theta x m n. As you go up, you will get this theta y m plus one n. And then this hop I associate instead with net minus this hop 
which gives you this one, and then the final part gives you this one. And in this Landau gauge, you can see that because I have this dot product of the magnetic vector potential and the link, the only contributions I will get will be from the Y links. So the links, uh, this one and this one. And if you just put this in, you will see that you get this expression, which simplifies down indeed to give you the amount of flux that you have uh, encapsulated, the aronoff bohm phase associated with the flux. Um, so when we write the Harper-Hofstadter model, we normally write it like this. Uh, so this is in, as I say, in a particular gauge, where now I only have these piles phases on some of the links. But if I were to do a closed hop around this plaquette, I get the right phase. Um, so this is basically the most natural way of taking a part charged particle in a magnetic field and putting it on a square lattice. And one of the amazing things that happens because we have the lattice there, we don't just get the continuum physics, but we actually get remarkable frustration effects coming about because we now have two length scales in the system. We now have the lattice spacing and the magnetic length. And as these two uh, length scales are commensurate or incommensurate, we get the emergence of this uh, amazing fractal energy spectrum. So this is a, as a function of the uh, number of flux quanta through a plaquette, what the energy spectrum looks like. And you can see it has this gorgeous so-called butterfly structure. And uh, one of the reasons that people in my field really love this is because the energy bands associated with this have got non-trivial topology and can have different values for the churn number. So I actually showed you an example of this last, les last lecture, um, where the example I gave was actually the Hofstadter model for a particular value of the flux. There's loads to say about this. I'm afraid I don't have time. But if you want to know some of the physics of the Hofstadter model, then do come and ask me afterwards, because it's one of the things I work a lot on. But I just want to say here that from that model that I showed you on the previous slide, uh, let's just get it back up. Oh, too fast. This model, this is a model that we know how to diagonalize. We can diagonalize it, for instance, on a computer. You can find the eigenstates. You can calculate the Berry curvature. You can sum up or integrate the Berry curvature over the Brillouin zone, and you will find the churn numbers associated with the bands. And so they can be everything from like one or one to even like minus four. You can have uh, infinite different values of the churn number according to the flux in your system. And it depends sensitively on this value of alpha. I also just wanted to highlight here what I was talking about before with the bulk boundary correspondence. So what I did here was I didn't just diagonalize it taking real space system. I first put periodic boundary conditions and Fourier transformed along that direction. And that meant that I could keep one of the momenta as a good quantum number. So on this cylinder, what my edge states now look like, so my edge states now are states that live on the edges of this cylinder. And one edge state in the unfolded kind of open system with open boundary conditions on all sides, now in this picture gives me these two edge states. So I have this part of the edge state which is on one end of the cylinder and the other part of the same edge state which lives on the other side of the cylinder. And then in this gap, if I sum up the churn numbers below this gap, that's one plus one, I should have two. And indeed, this pair is one edge state, and this pair is the other edge state. So this is what I mean by the bulk boundary correspondence. The churn numbers tell me about the number of these edge states. And these are chiral, because they all go across the gap with a particular group velocity, such that I get that chiral transport. OK. so. One of the reasons that we like the quantum Hall effect is those edge states, those uh, quantized, that quantized transport, but also because if you do add strong interactions, that you get really interesting physics coming out of it. OK, and this in itself would probably be a set of four lectures, so I'm afraid I just have a couple of slides about fractional quantum Hall effect. 
just to say what are the things that have really got us excited as a field about going here. So in particular, this is now the emergence of plateaus, not at integers, but at fractions of an integer of a filling fraction. And here, this is not something that I can explain to you with topological band theory, because strong interactions are really key. This is strong correlations coming through. And that allows for several different things to happen. And one of the things that people are, are very excited about is the possibility that some fractional quantum Hall states, um, not all, just some fractional quantum Hall states, may have quasi-particle excitations which can have non-abelian anionic statistics. Um, OK, so just to say again, I'm not saying very much more, but these lecture notes are really excellent about the fractional quantum Hall effect. So do go and have a look at those if you want to find out more. Can you also no, I'm afraid not. Partly because experiments in cold atoms and photonics are not getting there yet. <laughs> if we manage to do this, more practically than uh, yes of a fractional yeah exactly the topological degeneracy is very well defined <laughs> well we have ideas about how to try and actually do this in a photonic system so maybe we'll try and get that done and then i can come back and give a lecture about realizing it <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a really important question. So uh, this is the question of, this is Fermi electrons. So firstly, electrons are fermions. And secondly, they interact through via the Coulomb interaction. And so that's obviously important if I'm talking about a system which has strong interactions playing a key role. And indeed, there is um, substantial evidence that a lot of this physics can carry over when instead of Coulomb interactions, we have other types of interactions, such as uh, contact interactions like we could have in cold gases. So you could then imagine having a gas of fermions with contact interactions that should show uh, fractional quantum Hall physics. Um, with bosons, you can also get fractional quantum Hall states, but they become very qualitatively different. So for instance, all the filling fractions at which you observe them then become quite different. So for instance, the most typical fractional quantum Hall state for electrons that people talk about is like the one-thirds Laughlin state, whereas with bosons, it becomes the one-half Laughlin state. So it's, there's very close analogies, but a lot of the details do start changing. But we can still do fractional quantum hall with bosons and with contact interactions and things, other types of interactions like that. OK, I did just want to say a couple of words about anionic statistics um, just to motivate why we care about this. Uh, do forgive me, because this is not one of the bits that I'm an expert in, but I will try and give you uh, a sm small introduction. And so this is the idea that in two dimensions, we can have interesting statistics beyond just bosonic and fermionic statistics. And in particular, this comes about because uh, we can think that there is a well-defined orientation with which we can exchange particles in two dimensions. So in particular, when we exchange particles, we can exchange them in a clockwise or a counterclockwise way. OK, so let's exchange two particles, and they're indistinguishable. So once I've exchanged them, I basically come back to the same state. But let's say, for argument, that I could have gained up to a phase factor. So this is assuming they're in the same state. But in quantum mechanics, I could have got a phase factor. Now, in 2D, we have two options for what we do now. So this is basically option one. We exchange them counterclockwise. And then we exchange them clockwise. So you can see, in terms of uh, the length of my, line, uh, my arm is meant to be representing the world line of these particles. So as they, uh, as they evolve in time, we've exchanged them clockwise, uh, counterclockwise, and then clockwise. And then they continue on. The other option, uh, so that gains a phase and then undoes the phase. 
So we get back to exactly the same state. There's another option, and the key point is that this is different in two dimensions because we can exchange them clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise, and then anti-clockwise again, and I end up with my arms twisted twice like this. And this is not the same as doing that um, in kind of knot theory and uh, mathematically speaking. And indeed, we can have this phase factor, which now can be something other than just pi, which would have given us fermions, or zero, which would have given us bosons. And this is because we're in two dimensions. Now, non this is actually abelian anions. And so many quantum, fractional quantum Hall states may host abelian anions. But non-abelian anions go a step further because in that case, we have some uh, degeneracy of the exci these excitations such that we have a particular state within this degenerate subspace. And then exchanging the particles can allow us to rotate within that degenerate subspace. So it can change the quantum state. So now we can have this matrix, kind of this rotation of the eigenstates within this subspace. And matrices don't necessarily commute. And if they don't necessarily commute, then if they don't commute, we call these non-abelian anions. Because then we have systems where which particles we exchange, uh, it depends now, the quantum state that we get depends on the order in which we chose to exchange. So if you have, say, four particles, and you swap one and two, and then two and three, that will be different to if you'd swapped two and three, and then one and two. And people have thought about how this could be used for something called topological quantum computing, where the idea is that you take these non-abelian anions, and you take, for instance, two non-abelian anions and treat them as a qubit, and then you make these particle swaps, these exchanges, which uh, gives you these world lines, which are then not something that you can disentangle easily. So these are robust towards perturbations. And so the idea is that how you braid and exchange these non-abelian anions could be the execution of uh, logic gates in a quantum computer. Uh, this is a very good review, which talks about this in a lot more detail. I'm afraid I don't have time to go into it anymore. Um, we'll come back to this a little bit later. But the idea that we're trying to get towards is, OK, if we have fractional quantum Hall states, they could have these really cool quasi-particle excitations. Therefore, let's try and make fractional quantum Hall states. And we're still at the stage of trying to make the fractional quantum Hall states in my field. OK, so very quickly, before I get to the last part, I just want to say a very few words uh, about some other aspects of quantum Hall systems. So as I'm quite short on time, I'm going to go fast here. But do ask me more questions later. The first thing I want to say is that I showed you this topological classification with many other dimensions other than just the three spatial dimensions we normally live in. And that's because mathematically, you can calculate what the possible topological phases could be. OK, can you realize this in an experiment? What I will try and persuade you about tomorrow is that, yes, you can, using some tricks. And so therefore, we can care about these topological phases that exist in dimensions higher than three. And in particular, one of the things I've worked personally a lot on is this four-dimensional quantum Hall effect, which uh, here written in terms of the uh, conductance, uh, sorry, the current density uh, due to an electric field, you can see is now a nonlinear effect. So it also requires another magnetic perturbation. But now it depends on a 4D topological invariant that's called the second Chern number. Uh, so do come and ask me more about that. But basically, it's just saying that there are generalizations of that Chern number to higher dimensions that lead to new quantum Hall effects in 4D, 6D, and 8D. Another thing I just want to mention very briefly is the idea of a topological pump. So this is really a big idea in the fields of cold atoms and photonics at the moment, which is that, OK, we have a Chern number. And to get the Chern number, we integrated a Berry curvature that depended on kx and ky. But did they really need to be kx and ky? They just need to be 
periodic functions. And in particular, you could imagine having a Berry curvature that was defined with respect to kx, and a Berry curvature that was uh, also a function of a periodic parameter, now a periodic pump parameter, that is something we're changing over time in the system. So this is now a dynamical system, but we're changing a system dynamically um, and periodically, such that the eigenstates have a Berry curvature with respect to kx and this pump parameter phi. And then we can again talk about churn numbers. But now we're actually one dimension down. We're in 1D. And this would have uh, physical consequences in the center of mass shift, for instance, after every period. So this is a kind of a quantum version of an Archimedes screw that we're turning this, we're modulating the system periodically, and we're getting the transport of particles through the system. And it goes right the way back to Thaulus in the 1980s, just after the discovery of the quantum Hall effect. So it's basically just saying, OK, this doesn't really need to be two dimensions. It could be 1D plus a periodic dimension. Um, however, of course, we have to be careful because this isn't really a dynamical variable. Um, this is something fixed that we're doing to the system. OK, I think I'm going to skip the next bit. But this is just talking about uh, how we can go from a 2D quantum Hall effect to a 1D topological pump. And this is just the recipe that you need to follow in order to get there. So it's basically Fourier transforming with respect to one of the dimensions and then replacing that Fourier transform dimension with an artificial pump parameter. So it's what we call dimensional reduction. It takes you from a 2D topological system to a 1D pump. And the important thing to note is that this is much, much simpler because we started with the 2D Hofstadter model, which is a part, uh, charged particle with gauge fields and all the rest of it. And we ended up with a dynamical 1D hopping model just with on-site potentials. So we've actually really decreased the complexity of what we need to simulate. OK, so now I want to say a few words about some of the other topological phases within this periodic table. Uh, so first off, we have these things called topological insulators. And they are what really started the system going in 2005. And I want to highlight, firstly, one of the things about time reversal symmetry, which is the key to understanding these phases of matter. So these, unlike churn insulators, have time reversal symmetry. And the key point here is that they have time reversal symmetry for spin a half particles. So time reversal symmetry for a spinless particle is actually just charge conjugation. Because you can think about that momentum has to flip. Uh, momentum in quantum mechanics is IH bar grad. So Flipping it, you can just change the sign of the I, charge conjugation. If you want to do spin half, you also need to flip the sign of the spin in time reversal. So time reversal also needs to flip the sign of the spin, so you need to add in some Pauli matrices there to do that flip. Now, these symmetries have very different properties if you calculate what happens when you take that symmetry operation and you square it, so you apply it twice. And in particular, in the first case, you can show that t squared is just plus 1, because charge conjugation and then charge conjugation again just brings you back uh, is just plus 1, the identity. But t squared in the second case is minus 1. So this is actually what I meant in that topological classification when I had those columns about the symmetry. The idea that t, the time reversal operator, t squared could be plus 1, minus 1, or 0 if it was broken. And this is a general thing that distinguishes bosons and fermions. And in particular, uh, one of the important things for fermions is that t squared equals minus 1, which means that we have something called Kramer's theorem. So Kramer's theorem is asking ourselves what happens when we have a system with time reversal symmetry. So let's have a Hamiltonian with some eigenstates. And this Hamiltonian has got time reversal symmetry, which means that if we apply uh, the time reversal operation like this, that we get back to the same Hamiltonian. Now, what if we take the time reversal operator and act it on a state, and then act the Hamiltonian from the right-hand side? 
Now, I can act on the left-hand side with t, t minus 1, because that's just an identity. It's t times its inverse. But this part here is just h. So now I have h acting on psi, which gives me e. So now uh, e is just a number. So I can take that through. Uh, it's, got, it's real. So I can take that through t. And then I have e t psi. So h t psi equals e t psi. So that means t psi is also an eigenstate. OK? So that is fine. If I have a time reversal symmetric Hamiltonian, then t psi is also an eigenstate of that Hamiltonian. Now, the question comes, is this the same state? Have I just operated with time reversal and got the same state? So if it were the same state, then t psi should just be psi up to a phase factor. Now, let's see. For fermions, t squared equals minus 1. So let's start from minus psi, because this is slightly easier. So minus psi, well, minus 1, so that's just t squared psi. And then I act with t psi, one of the t psi's to get me e to the i psi. Then I take e to the i psi, uh, e to the i alpha through that t, but t can change charge conjugation, so it flips the sign. Okay, so we know that T has got charge conjugation in it, so you get that. And then T acts on the psi again, and we get E to the I alpha. Now those two go away, so this tells us that minus psi equals psi. Ah, no, that's uh, not good. So this was, if they were the same state, then we get this contradiction. And that tells us for time reversal, fermionic systems where T squared equals minus 1, all the eigenstates have to be twofold degenerate. So psi and t psi have to be different states. Good? Uh, key point for bosons, t squared equals plus 1. So we don't have Cramer's theorem. And actually, this caused a lot of problems in uh, photonics for a while before we figured this all out. But I'll talk more about that tomorrow. And so what they realized in... Uh, 2005 was that this has really important consequences when we're talking about topology. Because if we now consider a Hamiltonian h of k, then the time reversal operation t h of k t minus 1, so it's h of minus k. But then if I look at what uh, therefore t acting on psi should do, it should flip the sign of, uh, to minus psi. So these are time reversal symmetric partners, and they have to have the same energy, because I said that psi and t psi are both eigenstates with the same energy. So this tells us that there's this symmetry in the Brillouin zone. That's cool, but what about those quantum Hall states? Well, now you can see straight away that a quantum Hall state has to break time reversal symmetry, because it should have a reflection symmetry. The dispersion should have a reflection symmetry about this point, and it doesn't. OK? So chiral edge states on their own are not possible with time reversal symmetry for fermions. And so what they asked was, well, what if we just take a quantum Hall state for one spin and the opposite quantum Hall state, so with the opposite, say, magnetic field for the other spin, and add the two together. And then we have a chiral edge state going in one direction from, say, the spin, uh, going, a spin up going this way, and a spin down going this way. And that now does satisfy this uh, required symmetry, the time reversal symmetry. And the key point is that here, these bands are now made up of these time reversal symmetric partners so they're protected by Cramer's theorem. It means we can't open this. So at this point, we can't, break, we can't break this open. We can't mix the states. And so these have to be very robust. And what they found was that this is the example of a time reversal invariant or quantum spin Hall system. So in particular, we have a uh, two possibilities. We have that the points at 0 and points at pi have to be the Cramer's degenerate points. And either at the Fermi level, we have an even number of pair edge states crossing this, in which case we can imagine taking this whole band and pushing it down 
out of the band gap, perturbing it away, or we have an odd number, in which case this is robust, because we, can't, we don't have the freedom anymore to push all of the edge states uh, using perturbations. And this gives you, uh, sorry, I'm going very fast, but this gives you the idea of this topological invariant. So this is just saying in words that we can imagine taking uh, spin up plus phi and spin down minus phi. And then in the simple case, if we have spin conservation, that gives us the topological invariant very straightforwardly by just counting how many edge states that we have. And this is the picture that we have in mind. And now we could include spin mixing terms, but they actually preserve the uh, Z2 classification provided those spin mixing terms are time reversal invariant. Okay, so take home message, this was quite complicated, but quantum spin hall system, at the basic level, you can just take copy of quantum hall for spin up, opposite copy of quantum hall for spin down, add the two together, and that's already a pretty good quantum spin hall state from what I care about. But all of the other things you can do to the system lead to the whole plethora of interesting phenomena in topological insulators and really revitalize this field. <laughs> okay, I haven't explained a 3D topological insulator because uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but I quite like this picture of it. So as opposed to having these edge states, this one. So these are now surface states that are going across. And so uh, this is an example of how the spin surface states would cover the surface. So you can use, you can relate again, uh, everything comes down with topological insulators to the time reversal symmetric points within the Brillouin zone. And in particular, in the 3D topological insulator case, it's about how the Fermi surface uh, at, the surface, at the surfaces of these 3D materials, how the uh, 2D Brillouin zone, in the, in the 2D Brillouin zone, the Fermi surface either encapsulates one of these time reversal points, or uh, I think it's an odd number or an even number of these time reversal points, is then related to that. So. <laughs> yes. An odd number, so it's uh, about, on the, in the surface Brillouin zones, yes, in these time reversal invariant points, whether the Fermi, where the Fermi surface is going. And according to that, you can de derive the strong topological invariant, which is the one that is most important for characterizing 3D topological insulators. Uh, that, if you, add frac if you add interactions, then I think there is some thought that the, topological, the fractional topological insulators would then be quite related to a fractional quantum Hall effect. But, and I think they should have topological degeneracy, but I really can't say any more about that. I'm not so much of an expert. Okay, right. So I think I will choose to skip the SSH model uh, I'm afraid I, I'm running out of time sufficiently much, but this is just, uh, you can ask me up about it later if you like. This is a class that has now this mysterious chiral symmetry, and we like it because it's actually a very, very simple example of a topological phase. Uh, I won't go through the slide, but just to say that uh, it's the model for polyacetylene. And it can be thought of as edge states that arise when you have a type binding lattice with two different hoppings. And depending on the value of the two different hoppings, the bipartite, uh, this bipartite lattice can either have protected edge states at the boundary or not. I want to say something very quickly just about topological superconductors before the chair tells me to sit down. Uh, and so therefore, let's just have a quick look through these slides. Now, the point I want to make is that I've talked up to now about really independent electrons, but all that I really needed was the fact that I had gapped bands in a system. And so I could think about another case where I have gapped bands, 
uh, gaps, uh, gaps in my system, which is above a superconducting ground state. So this is just a mean field uh, superconductor. So in the mean field, we've replaced some of the interaction with the mean field pairing potential. And this is just the Bogolubov degen Hamiltonian. And this is usually gapped according to the superconducting pairing potential. But one of the remarkable things that people realize is that in a topological superconductor, there can be protected states within this gap. Uh, so to see that, we can just think about particle hole symmetry. So this is the other generic symmetry that I mentioned. And now particle hole symmetry is very much like the time reversal symmetry, except that there's now a minus sign here. And this means that if we were to go through the same sort of derivation that I had before, what we would now find is that particle hole symmetry means that every state psi has a partner uh, now not at E, but at minus E because of that minus sign. So particle hole symmetry gives you a reflection symmetry now around E equals zero, okay? So before time reversal gave us a symmetry around uh, uh, with respect to k equals zero, but now we have uh, a symmetry with respect to e equals zero, um, and also k going to minus k. But we also have the idea that we have a particle hole redundancy, uh, because actually we know that creating a quasi-particle in this site E is actually the same as removing a quasi-particle from this state, state minus E, because that's what we have in a superconductor. And so that means that now we can imagine the case where, say, we do have states within a band gap of a topological superconductor. So normally this gap is delta, the mean field pairing potential, but now we have two possibilities. At, say, in 1D, we can have states at the edge. Now, if these states are away from E equals zero, then you're able just to perturb them out of the gap, because as long as the energy here and the energy is minus the energy here, you can just perturb those out of the gap. But you can't if you have a state at E equals zero, a single state. And this state at E equals zero, because of this redundancy I told you about, actually also has the property that it is, it's, uh, the creation operator for this state is also the same as the annihilation operator. And that is what we call a Majorana a fermion. So this is just saying that if we have particle hole symmetry, it's possible to have states that are pinned at equal zero and that are topological and that are these Majorana fermions. And in two dimensions, Majorana fermions, uh, we can think about their exchange statistics as another type of non-abelian anions. So people also like this because of its links to topological uh, quantum computing. Now, in the notes that you can find online, I give you the example of one of the simplest topological superconductor models, which is the Kitayev chain. And this is very much like the SSH chain, but now uh, we don't have different hoppings, but we have this pairing potential. And so you can go through that slide to see how we get the appearance of E equals zero edge states. And this is just to say, in two dimensions, we can have 2D topological superconductors, where now the topological invariant tells us about the number of Majorana edge modes around the system. And in particular, if we have a vortex in the system, then we can think about a vortex in a superconductor as creating an extra little edge for us, so we can end up having Majorana modes, these edge modes hosted also at that vortex. By tuning a flux through that vortex, we can make that have zero energy. And so the idea in a topological quantum computer based on topological superconductors would be to have Majoranas in these vortices and then to move the vortices around and then braid them in order to do that braiding I talked about to give you the logic gates. Um, and just to say, so, one thing that uh, I want to emphasize is that these are quite unusual superconductors because they're not S-wave pairing. Normally in a superconductor, your pairings spin up and spin down. But here, we're actually, the simplest models are all spinless pairing. And so we can get this, for instance, with various types of P-wave pairing, which means that 
we have to try a little bit harder to find them in the laboratory. And so people have been looking, uh, and there's hope that maybe we could find them in some types of unconventional superconductors. Uh, also, uh, the quasi-particles that I mentioned, some of them are examples of Majorana fermions, or in uh, proximity devices. So this is where we have, for instance, a system with strong spin-orbit coupling coupled to a superconductor. And the idea is now that the spin-orbit coupling changes the dispersion. So it means that you have uh, spin-up dispersion going one way, spin-down dispersion going another way in momentum space. And if we open a gap with a Zeeman field, so this is the spin-orbit coupling plus a Zeeman field, we now can have a Fermi energy that is intersecting this point and this point. And so you could have even S-wave pairing giving rise to an effective kind of spinless superconductivity. And there is mounting experimental evidence that indeed in this kind of system, you can see Majorana fermions. Uh, so that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the more exotic topological phases. So I spent most time on Quantum Hall because that's where cold atoms and photons really is at the moment, and I'll be telling you about that tomorrow. But I also wanted to whet your appetite for some of the more exciting things that we have on the horizon, and in particular uh, towards this topological superconductivity, which you know, solid state physicists are still struggling with. So maybe if we can improve the cold atom, and cold atom setups sufficiently, we could get there first. Thank you.